Psalm 119, that's where we're gonna be today. Um, if you wanna turn your Bibles there, we'll get to it in a second, but we're gonna be um, in Psalm 119, starting in verse 101. Uh, but here's what I wanna do. I wanna give some information some interesting information about this chapter. So if you're new today, what we're doing, we're going through the book of Psalms, and um, not all of them, but just for about seven weeks, and this is week two, and we're gonna be looking at each individual chapter, and when we're in a Psalm, we're gonna kind of give context for who wrote it, what was going on, what are some interesting things about that Psalm. So here's some information about Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the entire Bible, 176 verses. It's arranged in an acrostic pattern with 22 separate sections of eight verses, each beginning with a different letter from the Hebrew alphabet. It's a really cool thing when you look at it from that angle. Also, the authorship has been debated, but mostly is ascribed or attributed to King David, uh, mostly because of the pattern of writing. It really fits his poetic writing in other areas of the psalm. There are actually, tradition says, that King David used Psalm 119 and its structure of the Hebrew alphabet to teach his son Solomon how to read. Uh, using the Hebrew alphabet from Psalm 119, which I thought was pretty cool information. Um, also, I wanted to show you guys this. When you're reading the Psalms, there's a lot of different wording uh, that comes up, and where I, you, some people wonder, what are all the differences here? And I wanna show you this table um, that, that uh, I found from several commentators, and it kinda, you wanna take a picture of it or whatever, I know it's gonna be a lot to write down, but this will help you when you're studying the book of Psalms to know what each individual word means in several translations. So the law generally refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, my uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, the testimonies, uh, God's standard of conduct according to the Ten Commandments, way or ways, the pattern of life uh, required by God, precepts, a commandment or requirement, statutes, enacted laws, commandments, orders, God's decree, judgments or rules, a binding law, judicial law, word or promise or promises, a general term of God's revelation. So when you're reading through these in the NIV, NASB, ESV, whatever translation you have, you're gonna see some of these different words used and this will help you identify what the writer, and it's all through the Psalms, not just this chapter, what the writer specifically was referring to when you read the word rules, you're like, I, I don't know about rules, but what does it actually mean in history and in context? And it'll be pretty enlightening when you're going through the Psalms. I know it's helped me. So here's the truth. The Bible, especially the Psalms, a lot of the Psalms contains the ways of God. The Bible is referred to as the word of God. We just saw on the screens through rules, testimonies, the law, and a lot of these words honestly have a really bad reputation lately because, I don't know, more and more people just don't like rules, don't like laws. Even from God, people have a tendency to look to God and say, who do you think you are putting rules in a Bible? How interesting of a thought is that, to look to the creator of the universe and say, who do you think you are? But the laws, the rules in scripture are not meant to bind us, they're meant to set us free. And so we see these all through the Bible. And um, when we think about laws and we think about rules, they're there, like again, to set us free and to keep us from chaos. That's the whole point of these laws, rules, and judgments that we see in scripture. Um, the other day, I experienced one of the lawless moments ex I've experienced in my entire life. And you guys know what I'm talking about because you've all experienced it before. I, I was driving down the road, coming to church actually one day for work, and I was pulling up to a street light and there was a little bit more traffic than normal at that light. And as I got closer, I figured out that something had happened overnight and that traffic light went out. And all of a sudden, it became a four-way stop. And you guys know what I'm talking about. It turns into the Wild West at a four-way stop where people are used to a traffic light. We all went to driver's ed. We all know the rules. But when you get to a four-way stop, when there's a traffic light, everybody forgets the rules. And all of a sudden, you pull up and you go, I know there's something about the person to the right. And I know there's something about this. But when people are turning left and going straight and they don't know what's going on, people are pulling out into the middle of the intersection and honking. And the best you can do when you pull up to the intersection is you just look around and you go, I feel like now is right. And I'm going to start just slowly going out there and hope I don't die. Anybody else? It's lawless. And everybody else is doing the same thing as you, but they all look at you like you're dumb, and you're like, I was doing the same thing as you. And that's what's crazy. You pull up to an intersection, and it just turns into a lawless, chaotic moment. And the truth is, that's where we're at right now in the world. That's where we're at. 
It's like we're at this critical juncture, this intersection for the history of our nation, where we're at with morality, where we're at with the future of our families and our lives, and we're at this critical intersection of life, and we know many of us have church in our backgrounds. We were raised in church. We know enough of the word of God. We went to spiritual driver's ed, but when we come to these critical junctions in life, it's like it's all thrown out the window. Laws are gone, and I'm just gonna do what I feel is right and there are accidents and there are casualties all over the place because people have forgotten the law. They've forgotten the rules. They've forgotten the guidelines, the loving guidelines of God in his word. And I'm gonna emphasize this a lot today because if you were taught that the ways of God and the laws of God were meant to bind you, you were taught wrong. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill them. He didn't come to do away with God's guidelines and morality. Yes, there's grace, and yes, there's love, but there's also a specific way to live in Scripture. So I want to show you this, just in case. I can't move on until I show you this. So I talk about the four-way stop, and I found this online, and I just want to say, okay, these are the rules. I just got to show you, has nothing, it's nothing spiritual, it's not the Word of God, but this is it. First to stop, first to go. Let's just all take this in for a moment. First to stop, people are taking pictures. Like, I got it, I got to know this. Okay, First to stop, first to go. Rule two, farthest right goes first. That's always confused me because you keep going right and it's a big circle. You're like, I don't know. And you have an anxiety attack. Rule three, straight traffic goes first. Honestly, I'd forgotten that. Rule four, when in doubt, bail out. And that is not what we do. When in doubt, we bail in. We go for it, when in doubt, right? But those are the rules. Take it or leave it. Nothing spiritual. Let's move on. Okay. (laughs) All right, let's see if I'll do that in 10 o'clock. Um, okay, so I, I wanna read to you uh, Psalm 138. We're gonna jump chapters just for a moment, just one verse from Psalm 138, verse two. <clears throat> King David absolutely wrote this one. It's attributed to him, and he said, you have exalted above all things two things. I want you to remember this. He's talking to God. You have exalted above all things your name and your word. You gotta remember that as we go through the message today. King David is talking to God. This is in scripture. Holy Spirit breathed for us today. He says, God, you have exalted two things above everything else, your name and your word. You wanna know what's so cool about the structure of church on a Sunday morning and why Sunday morning is so important? Because we do those two things mainly every Sunday. We lift up the name of God in worship and we say your name is above all names, right? And then we put emphasis on the word of God and what he said to us every single Sunday. That's why the gathering here is so important because we put emphasis and priority on what God said is priority. So again, the, the, the passage today we're gonna be in and I'm gonna move quickly is Psalm 119, 101 through 112. I'm not going to read it again because it was read just a few minutes ago, but I do want to dive, dive into it. So here it is. Here's, here are the points today. We should love the word of God because what we see in this passage is that the writer, King David, loved the word of God through all 176 verses. We should love the word of God on account of its, number one, source. We should love the word of God, this word of God, not on account that someone called it the word of God, not on account that it's a a, a book, but we should love this word because of the source of the word, the source of the word. Um, I, I, I think back to high school and college, and on one hand, research papers stressed me out, and on the other hand, it was one of the only things I was really good at in high school and college was writing research papers. But even though I liked it on one hand and I felt good at that little thing, you put math in front of me and I'm like, thank God I'm a pastor. Okay, but you you put writing, I I, I loved it. But I hated one thing about it because I I don't know why I always use sources. I didn't mind citing sources. I cite sources even now when I preach, but it always stressed me out to try to get the formatting because teachers and professors would always emphasize, cite your sources. Here's the structure. Cite your sources because the teacher knew and was emphasizing for you information at best is random until you know the source of the information. The value of information is only there because of the source that gave us the information. If we're just making stuff up in a research paper and we have no sources that we're citing, then the information cannot, there cannot be a value placed on it because we're not citing our sources. And that's exactly what this point is. The source of the word of God is God. It's so basic. 
But what we try to do over time is separate those two, and they cannot be separated. Psalm 119, 101 through 104, I want you to see the emphasis that the writer puts on it, the fact that this is God's word. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to, taste, to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. There is no doubt in the writer's mind that there is one source for the word of God, and it's God. Yes, it was men that wrote the Bible, but the source within the men, behind the men, around the men, was the Holy Spirit. And I've heard some people say, how in the world? Can you put your trust in a book written by men? That's not even possible. God didn't write it, people did. But the same people that would doubt that God could work through humans to put a book together are the same people that don't doubt that God may have put all of the universe and all the planets and all of the solar systems in place. We'll believe God is the creator, but God forbid him work through men to put a book together. But that's what we have to remember is if God created the universe and God says he created this word, then it's his word. It's God's word. This is valuable, not because people wrote it, but because God said it. That's why it's valuable. And that's why the writer was talking about how much he loves the word. I mentioned a second ago, we cannot separate the Bible from God's word. And there's a constant temptation to do that. We will call it God's word. We'll call it the Bible. But we have to remind ourselves every day that this is not just good information. It's not just truth. It is God's word. It is from him, from his Holy Spirit. And the love for God and the love for his word go hand in hand. You can't separate them. More and more, I talked about a minute ago, we're at this critical intersection in history right now. But even Christians, more and more, are trying to separate those two things, say, well, I love God, but there are just some things in his word that I don't jive with. You can't say you love the source and not what the source says and believes. I can't love God and not like what he says. I mean, there's times I look at it and go, I don't necessarily like that, but I'm gonna learn to yield to it. It's not that you read everything in the Bible for the first time, and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know, oh, I'm not even a believer anymore because I don't feel like I like that. That's the nature of humanity. You look at it, I don't like it, but who said it? God, and you learn to ease into it and to yield to it because God said it, not a person. Have you ever been around in a group of people and you're talking about something the whole group loves? I mean, of course, everyone loves the Cowboys, so we could go with that one. I mean, you know, everybody's like, everybody in the group is like, I love the Cowboys, or you could go a different route. There's a certain band, and you're just talking about, oh, man, this band. I mean, you could talk, you know, Beatles or whoever, you know, you're, you know, Boston, whatever, you're whatever your band is. I can keep going, but nobody's, you guys like any of those bands. Okay, so you could, you could be, in a, you're all talking about, oh, man, we love, we love, and there's always one person in the group, whenever there's another group, talking about everything they love, there's always one person that's kind of looking around going, yeah, yeah, I, I love them, too. I love them too. And you know that they don't because they don't really know anything about them. And then all of a sudden somebody goes, yeah, hey, what's your favorite song? And you're like, I, I mean, like, you know, that, that one thing, you know, like that one song that I, yeah, I was on the radio. And you know, you may like the Beatles. You may like the sound of the Beatles. You may recognize a song once you hear it on the radio, but you can't say you love them if you don't know songs, if you don't know their names, if you don't know things about them. You might like it occasionally when you stumble upon it, but you don't love them. And it's the same thing with the word of God. We have to learn the word of God. I can say I love God. I can say I love his word, but if I don't know his word, then I don't love his word. I may occasionally like it when I stumble upon it, when I hear it on a Sunday, but unless I'm in it myself every day, I don't love his word. I don't love his word. And again, I want to be careful. I'm not talking about an extreme. I'm not saying you have to have the whole Bible memorized and I'm not trying to put guilt on people. But what I am saying is how in the world can we truly know who God is if we don't know his word? How can we know him? We've got to love him and his word. King David also writes in Psalm 18 about his love, not only for the word, but the source of the word. Psalm 18, 30 through 36 says, the ways of God are without fault. The Lord's words are pure. He is a shield to those who trust him. 
I love that. He's a shield to those who trust him. That word trust is put their weight on. He shields people who yield to him. Verse 31, he, who, who is God? Only the Lord. Who is the rock? Only our God. God is my protection. He makes my way free from fault. He makes me like a deer that does not stumble. He helps me stand on the steep mountains. He trains my hands for battle. You protect me with your saving shield. You support me with your right hand. You have stooped to make me great. You give me a better way to live, so I live as you want me to. King David is saying, I've tried a whole lot of things in my life, but my life went the best. I had the most security. I had the most confidence. I was the most blessed when I yielded to the ways of God. I'll, before I go to the second point, I just want you to think about this question. If God is the creator, if all of this is real, if God's real, if what we're doing right now is real, we were worshiping a real God a few minutes ago, we're learning from a real book that God put together through his word, if all of this is real, if it's real, how much do you really trust and put your weight on what King David was saying, trusting and yielding to what God says. If he is who he says he is, then what is our response to that? Number two, we should love the word on account of its substance. Substance, number one was source, number two, substance. When you think about substance of the word of God, there, I remember when I first started ministry, I, I used to think, I would watch my dad, I mean, just hundreds, and if not thousands of sermons growing up. I was in church every Sunday, every Sunday night, we had church services back then, every Wednesday night, every time the church doors were open. And I remember stressing out when I first started in ministry going, I'm gonna preach the whole Bible in the first three or four years and have nothing else to say. <laughs> like, I, I mean, you, you can't, you, how, what am I gonna do? Like, I remember really stressing about that and saying that to my dad, he just starts laughing because there's so much substance. I could preach on the story of David and Goliath for 20 weeks straight, and we're gonna find different things that God says in that story just, just because we went deeper and deeper and deeper into it. I wanna show you how much substance there is just in Psalm 119. There was a man named Thomas Manton, a Puritan preacher, who wrote a three-volume work on Psalm 119. Three-volume work. Each one of these volumes is over 500 pages. In total, 16 177 pages, 190 chapters, which means there are more than one chapter per verse that this Puritan preacher wrote on one chapter in the entire Bible of 66 books. The substance is so deep, but we won't fall in love with the word until we value the substance of it. I value the source, and then when I value the substance, but you can't value the substance, until you start experiencing it. One of my favorite things in the world to do is just study the Bible. And I know some of you are like, well, that's your job. Actually, it's not, really. I mean, I'll study the Bible to preach, but I'm not talking about the job part of this. I'm telling you one of the most enjoyable things ever is reading a passage that you've read a 100 times, and before you read it, just saying, Holy Spirit, speak to me through what I'm about to read. Because all of this is real. And when you ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, guide you as you're reading God's word, there are different things that come out. There could be something you read two months ago about a hardship and God is gonna be your refuge and your strength and your shield. And you're like, that's great for someone else. Life is awesome right now. Two months later, something happens and the substance of God's word is so deep, the Holy Spirit will remind you of what you read two months ago. You'll go back and reread it and it's almost as if you're reading a completely different passage because of how it's ministering to you today. There is substance in his word. Psalm 119, 103 in the passage for today, says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How many of you guys love honey? Anybody love honey? How many of you guys like a warm, fresh sopapilla? If you're from Maui and you don't know what this is, I feel sorry for you, but when next time you come out here, we're gonna tell you. I mean, I don't know, there's nothing better than when that waitress or waiter comes out and they say, would well, you want your, your sopas, this is a New Mexico thing, sorry, with or after your meal? Let's take a vote. How many of you guys do after? How many of you guys do with? See, I want it after because I want it hot. 
I want them coming out and I want to get done with my enchiladas or whatever I'm eating and then look at that sopapilla and when I poke my hole in it like a five-year-old, you know, that steam, how many of you guys do that too? That's your method of eating a sopapilla. You get people in Maui are like, what is happening in Albuquerque? You poke this hole in the top of a sopapilla and then you fill that thing with honey like you're a five-year-old and it's getting all over your kid's menu. I mean, that, that's what I do. And I, I'll fold that thing and the honey is just hot and oh my gosh. And you start, how many of you guys want one right now? We have 500 that are coming out for, no, we don't. Gosh, I wish. That would have been a really good idea. So, I mean, just, I, I love a good soap of pia that, that you get that honey in there. Oh my gosh, it is so good. And that's how King David is describing the word of God. Woo. He was absolutely thinking about soap of pias in ancient Israel. And he's, I mean, <laughs> but that's what he's talking about though. The sweeter than honey. It's like the taste of my mouth. I mean, that was honey to them back then was the candy. It was, it was the chocolate. It was everything we think of. But when, man, when you're hungry and you have bread and you add honey to it, that's what he's saying the word of God is in all seriousness. He's saying when you understand the substance of the word of God, you don't interpret it as bitter, sour, or harsh. You interpret it as sweet as honey. Because you see the value in the law, the value in the judgments, the value in the rules are guardrails because driving in life, when just going through life is like driving on a cliff's edge. And the law of God, the word of God are like guardrails and no one is driving on the edge of a cliff looking at the guardrails saying, I feel very squeezed in by these guardrails. I, I'm mad about it. We all look at the guardrails and say, thank you for whoever put those there. And that's what King David is saying about the word of God. He says in Psalm 119, 11, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. The longer, the longer you're in the word, the sweeter the word gets. And what King David is saying is your testimonies are my heritage forever. Your law, it's my heritage forever. Now that's a bold statement being thousands of years ago. In ancient Israel, when King David's writing this, that's a bold statement to say, your law is going to be sweet forever. But what's amazing, I was telling my wife this week, writing this message, what I love about Christianity, what I love about what we believe, is that the law of God is just as sweet today as it was at the time when God gave the law to Moses. You look at, I wanna show you this. Remember, testimonies is going back to the 10 commandments. I wanna show you the 10 commandments real quick. I wanna show you these, and I want you to read through this. Oh, so you shall have no other gods before me. So God is, is God, right? Everything else, we gotta put most emphasis on him. You shall not make for yourself an idol. People are like, well, I don't really, I don't make idols. What this is saying is don't put anything as a priority over him. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor or lying. You shall not covet. You shall not be envious and want something that's not yours. Just these 10 commandments. Can you imagine what the world would look like if we just stopped down and just started obeying some of the most ancient laws in human history that came from God, they're just as good and remarkable today as they were back then. Can you imagine a world if we just took those 10 and just said, we're gonna yield to that? Oh, what I love about the word of God is no matter how hard people try to destroy it, to say it's not useful for today, to say it's an ancient, misused, all these different things, book that it doesn't apply today. The most, as oftentimes as people try to take this book and damage it, it's just as pure, perfect, undefiled, and applicable in 2022 as it was in 2000 BC. That's remarkable. It's remarkable because there's substance in the word of God. There's substance. And number three today is strategy. We love the word of God on account of its strategy. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Um, how many of you guys use the flashlight feature on your phones a lot? Had you ever play the game like when you're in your room and you know you like you get up in the middle of the night and have to go to the bathroom or something and you're like you, you kind of you feel like you have your room memorized like you go one do you guys ever do this or am I weird like okay it's like one I kind of think the end of the bed is here okay I'm gonna go boom and you hit you know whatever it is 
we now will use our iPhone or whatever flashlights. And so we'll use the flashlights. We're trying not to wake up our spouse. If you're married, you're in a dark place. Let me tell you something. Churches are beautiful. We have a beautiful church building here. But there is nothing, nothing more haunting and scary than a church building at night in the dark. I get here extremely early on Sunday mornings, like almost middle of the night early, and it's dark. And I'll go back there and put my stuff in, and I'll walk through the auditorium to go to my office. And I'm walking in here, and you hear every creak. And it's like, ah, like in just a few minutes, God, we're going to be worshiping you in here. It's going to be beautiful. But I feel like there's demons in here right now, you know. And so I'll, I'll, I'll turn my flashlight on, and I'll just be like walking through here. But what's interesting about an iPhone flashlight is you can only see about a three or four foot radius right in front of your feet. So I'll hear a noise, and I'll go, Whoo! And it, it doesn't work because I can't see up in the stadium seat. I'm like, ah, ah, ah. I can all, and I, I'm a grown man and I still do this. Don't laugh. You know you do it too. You're taking out the trash at night and you grown men run back inside the moment you hear something. And I'll take this flashlight and I'll do that. And I, I, my kids make fun of me now because I guess the new how you know you're old is because your flashlight on your phone is turned on and you don't know. And your whole family's like, your flashlight's on, dad. I'm like, ah, I don't even know how it came on. But what's interesting about this is the word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Now, most people when we pray to God will say, when we're wanting to know what God's word says about the future, we'll say, God, I need you to light my path. I, I wanna see the end result, God. Please just show me, you know, what, what does my future look like? Do you know there's never a promise one time in scripture where God ever says, I'm gonna lay it all out in front of you. There's a day by day cadence in scripture. There's a step-by-step -step cadence in scripture because faith is intricately woven into our everyday lives. And so what it's saying is this, your word is a lamp. So everywhere you go, you're only gonna see the steps right in front of you. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I can see my feet and I can see a little bit of the path. God, you may not tell me what 10 years looks like. You may not tell me what two months looks like, but I know today your word is guiding me your word, what you've said, the truth of your word. And people are looking in here and they're saying, well, it doesn't say who I'm supposed to marry. It doesn't say where I'm supposed to go to college. But what it does say is how to be close enough with God to where you are walking step by step with him to where you're not having to ask God, where do I go? But you're walking in such good relationship with him. The light is guiding you because you're with him. He's taking you step by step. So many people are so burdened with, what am I supposed to do, God? And God's saying, just walk with me, step by step, day by day, and I'll take you there. We don't want a flashlight, though. We want a spotlight. We want something to light up the whole path. And God's just saying, that's not how I work. It's not how I work. He's a light unto our feet. The light of God's word does two things in closing. Number one, it provides wisdom. And number two, it prevents wandering. The light of God's word provides wisdom and prevents wandering. And here, here's what's interesting. One of these, number one, is what everyone needs right now in the world, wis the wisdom of God. And I don't know if there's ever been a time in history where more people have been wandering, even believers, than they are right now because we want revelation from God. We want God to, to speak right through the ceiling and say, this is what, we want a feeling. I want God to, to nudge me and, and tell me, this is what you're supposed to do. Does God still speak today? Yeah, but, but he has spoken. This isn't just a Bible. This is the voice of God in our lives. It guides you and provides wisdom. It puts you if we abided by this, it puts you in the circle of friends and mentors you need to be in that will help guide your life. It puts you in the worship environments to be guided and pressed by the Holy Spirit. When we live by this word, we're not consumed by what's gonna happen in the future. We don't need the spotlight. The light, the lamp of God's word becomes good enough. We need wisdom and it prevents wandering as well. It prevents wandering because again, people are so restless today. We, we put time constraints on God. God, I really need to know this now. I mean, I'm getting older. When's this spouse gonna come? When's my new job gonna come? I'm miserable. And I get all that, and God has compassion for all of that. But what he's saying is, you will perpetually wander when my word and my name 
are not prioritized above all of other things. That's what David told us. God, you have lifted up your name and your word. That's the highest calling of what a believer can do. And when we do those two things, when we are praising his name and when we are abiding by his word, we are being guided by his spirit. That's the bottom line. You look at the Israelites in Exodus, they go through the Red Sea. They think they're about to walk into the promised land. They think everything's gonna be great. What ends up happening? God's word was given to them. God's word said, I want you to go into the promised land and take that land. They didn't go because what they saw, what they felt trumped what God said. And they wandered and wandered and wandered for 40 years, an entire generation passed away. And then Joshua comes and he said, God, I believe your word. You said go, even if there's giants, you said go, even if it feels impossible, if there's fortified cities like Jericho, you said go. What your word says is more important and I value it more than what I feel, what I see and what people say. And I'm gonna take your word for it. And Joshua went and they conquered the giants. The walls of Jericho fell. I wonder how many fortified cities are in your future where the walls look intimidating, but they would fall if we just valued his word. The giants in our lives that just beat us up every day, how many of them would be defeated if we lifted his name more and valued his word above all things? That's what David put emphasis on in this passage. 119, chapter 119 tells us, fall in love with the word. That's hard because we live in a time where even a lot of Christians say, no, you fall in love with God, not his word. But what David shows us is, you can't have one without the other. One is what he says, and one is who he is. And when you get both of them and value them, you have everything you need. I wanna pray today, just that we would take this practical message home with us. And here's what I want you to do. There are so many apps. I was gonna put a few examples on scripture, or on the screen, but there are so many apps um, that I just was like overwhelmed with it. The Bible in One Year app is, is a phenomenal one that I've used a lot. Um, we have our Glorify app that we sponsor and we're a part of. Glorify, Bible in One Year, um, you version, obviously. It, it's, it's like the, uh, I don't know. Technology's made it so easy sometimes that that also decreases its value. But my challenge to you practically is this, and then we'll pray. Go home today. I know it's 4th of July weekend and there's so many distractions. Put something on your calendar. Schedule a meeting with whatever family you've got, close friends you've got, your, your tight-knit group, and say, how can we value God's word a little bit more than what we're doing right now? What's our big next step to value God's word? I'm gonna talk about it with my kids. I'm gonna talk about it with my friends. We're gonna join a small group. We're gonna join something. And there's actually a very practical small group I wanna recommend. Can I get that practical with you guys? There's a small group here that happens in, in, uh, on Thursday nights at 6.30. It's led by Dale Coffing. Um, and it's, call, it's called Disciple Makers Course. But there's a high emphasis on scripture memorization and techniques to do it. Let me tell you something. The reason, how, the reason Jesus defeated Satan in the wilderness when he was being tempted is because he had scripture on hand. Yeah. Satan would tempt him and Jesus said, oh no, I know. What was in the back of my mind is coming to the front of my mind and he had it memorized and that's how he combated and fought Satan. And uh, the Thursday nights at 6.30, Disciple Makers course, you can go to citizen.church slash groups and check that out. But it's a great small group Bible study to learn practical ways to uh, memorize scripture. Now, I just wanted to end with those practical things and pray for you. And I'm also in our prayer gonna pray for youth camp. And I want us to really, really pray. I don't want you to kind of like, oh, we're done. I'm gonna check out. I want you to stop and think, if I had a teenager who was not walking with God, who was going to camp, how would I want people to pray for my teenager? If I had a grandchild, a teenager that was going to camp, that was not walking with God, how would I want my church family to war with me in prayer for my teenager? And that's what I wanna do. I'm telling you, all we have is the next generation. And we have over 200 teenagers going to camp where I believe in every fiber of my being that there will be destiny placed on their lives. God will call people to do extraordinary things. I believe where there has been rebellion and walls built, that those walls will come crumbling down because of the prayer that's about to happen in this room. We're gonna pray a prayer of a hedge of protection over them and against any attack of the enemy and we're just gonna pray that those hearts that have been hardened would be soft and receptive to the Holy Spirit. Are you guys with me with that? Let's pray today. Father, we thank you so much for today. 
God, I pray that we as believers would begin to value your word as we value your name. Let us be students of your word. We can start small, one step at a time, but we know in our hearts, God, the more we know you and what you say, the closer we'll walk with you. We need your light for our steps to guide us. Be with us today. God, I pray for all of our teenagers. You know every one of them by name. God, I pray as they walk into these church services at night after having a blast all day, that something miraculous and spiritual would happen the moment they walk into that auditorium. I pray that there's a shield around that auditorium, God. I pray that the hardness that is placed on so many of these teenagers because of what, it, what they face every day of their lives, that the moment they walk through that doorway, that it would break and that your Holy Spirit would be there waiting on them and as they hear your word and as they worship, I pray healing tears would flow. I pray hardened hearts would break, that the real them, God, would surface. The child that used to love you that that child would come out of them again, God. Those teenagers that have walked away from you or the ones that never knew you or maybe just have never placed priority on you. I pray that this week would be a life-changing, miraculous week for them. We love our teenagers. We love the next generation. And we thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.